the I declare this meeting of the uh, Metro Council uh, Planning and Zoning Committee as well as Budget and Finance to order. Uh, today is Friday, June the 3rd. Um, the topic of this meeting is a presentation and site visit for the property located at 88 Hermitage Avenue. I uh, want to thank uh, Mayor John Cooper for being with us today. Um, I also see Mr. Surveys from uh, uh, Homeless Impact Division, I uh, appreciate MDHA staff for being here as well. Um, I will go ahead and get started. Um, we do have a pretty tight agenda leading up to our uh, site visit, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, the first segment for today's agenda is uh, the historical significance of the Tennessee School for the Blind Building. Our presenters include Dr. Leotha Williams, uh, Mr. Brian Tibbs, as well as Tim Walker, who is our director of the Historical Commission and I'll go ahead and turn it over to our presenters. Okay, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, good morning and um, thank you all for coming in this morning and um, providing me a few moments to speak to you about the significance of 88 Hermitage, a space that was formerly known as the Tennessee Colored School for the Blind. For me as a scholar of African American history, this space sits literally as a monument to African American history and their efforts to negotiate the boundaries placed upon them by Jim Crow segregation in Nashville. As I speak to you this morning, there are a few public memorials to this period in the city. And with the exception of Nashville's African-American churches and our esteemed historically black colleges and universities, very little of the built environment remains. Sadly, we as a city do not often recognize the significance of these properties until well after they have been demolished. And with the exception of placing a plaque or a marker in these spaces, there is very little left behind to remind us of the importance of these spaces in our history. One clear example of this is the corner of 8th Avenue North and Charlotte, where First Baptist Church Capitol Hill once stood. This church without doubt was one of the most important places in 20th century Nashville history. But today that space where people would later, who would later become icons in Nashville's and the civil rights movement, Today, that space serves as a largely, mostly vacant and inaccessible to the public parking lot. Um, the question that confronted me in my exploration of 88 Hermitage is simply why is the space significance significant in Nashville's African-American past? The Tennessee School for the Blind opened a segregated colored department for African-American students in 1881 as a result of the efforts of Nashville's representative to the 42nd General Assembly, um, African-American businessman Thomas Sykes. One historian of this space notes that the School for the Blind employed African-American women as matrons, as matrons and house mothers to run its color department. But there's one important note that we should consider, that this employment coincided with the rise of the colored women's clubs movement in this city. During the last decades of the 19th century, or women organized, black women organized clubs around the country to address the economic, social, and political needs of African Americans in a society that was becoming more resistant to their efforts to enjoy the full measure of American freedom. Members of this movement include women like Nettie Napier, the wife of noted businessman J.C. Napier, and the founder of the Day Home Club, 
a space that provided services for working black mothers. And also Dr. Josie Wells, the matriarch of Hubbard Hospital, who would provide medical care for women and children at the Day Home Club and in her private practice. I did not realize it until a few weeks ago, but 88 Hermitage is intimately connected to the history of African American women in this city. And it remains one of the only examples from our built environment to that period in the city's history. In short, 88 Hermitage stands as a monument to the efforts of the city's African American women to provide care and educational opportunities for one of the most historically vulnerable and underserved segments of our population. It has also been suggested that there has not been or there may not be another structure like this in America that is a space that was reserved for the education of African Americans that were visually impaired. I feel that this possibility alone is enough reason to preserve this space, one that our state historic preservation officer has suggested is eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Spaces. If this is true, its historical significance is on par with that of Hadley Park another space that was created for the exclusive use by African Americans. The thing that is striking to me, fellow citizens, is that Tennessee School for the Blind opened up its colored department eight years before the Supreme Court rendered its Plessy versus Ferguson decision, which made Jim Crow the law of the land. This facility opened its doors two years before the Brown case and it would not close until um, a year after the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. In short, um, I ask you to consider this, the volunteer, state commit, the volunteer state's commitment to segregation began early and ended late when it came to its, its blind African-American children. In closing, I would like to humbly submit to you that this building also serves as a mirror to Metro that demonstrates its commitment to preserving, highlighting, and protecting its African-American African -American spaces and past. And I ask you to question yourselves in terms of how would you rate the city's commitment to the preservation of historically black spaces? How has the city preserved African-American spaces? How have we memorialized historic African-American figures? While none of us can undo what was done in the past, um, we have control over what we do today and how we move forward from the present. I encourage you all to hold on to rehabilitate and to protect this important space. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Uh, thank you, Dr. Williams, also. I believe Brian Tibbs is on the line remotely and wanted to add a few words. Yes, um, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll be brief because that was very uh, eloquently said. Uh, but it, too often, and just two points, that too often we do miss the opportunity to take advantage of something so historical. Sometimes we look at a building and, and we're, we strictly make the decision on its uh, worth just by how it looks when we drive past it. We don't really take a real grasp of what took place in those spaces. Uh, we, we'll, if we put up a, a, a marker and we said we've done it, but we miss the whole value of the true history and that's that's embodied into what that building was. And I think we have a rare a rare case here. I mean, to understand that this is one of the definitely potentially the last one in Tennessee and maybe one of the last ones in the country. I mean, this is a, a unique structure that has a lot of significance uh, to the, you know, African-American culture, but even United States culture and history, uh, or, you know, that is something that we really should look at and be very proud of that this, uh, this structure still exists. Um, as far as the condition of it, too, I, I'm reminded of uh, the Ransom School that 
Uh, when I was on the historical commission, what couldn't be saved, and it was a, a similar type of architecture. And it went, and once again, we lose a real piece of history, uh, a, a building that is pretty much still intact, that can not only represent what happened there, but even uh, a significant piece of time. So this is this is a, I think, a great gem that is uh, relatively still intact from where it was. This will be a great thing that we could repurpose and have a true story behind it. So it's a, a type of project I think that will be a, a real value to Nashville. Thank you so much, Commissioner Tibbs. Director Walker. Uh, I, there's no more that I can add beyond what these two distinguished uh, men have said, but if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them either here or uh, I'll be along for the tour at the site and can answer them there too. Great, well, thank you so much for that. I, I wanna keep us on our schedule for our tour. So um, thank these panelists for the historic significance of the building. Our next uh, panel discussion group uh, is on the topic of housing and other site development potential. And I will welcome to the die um, Angie Hubbard, who's our housing director with the Metro Planning Department, uh, Dr. Troy White, uh, the executive director of MDHA and uh, Mayor Bill Purcell, who uh, is the chair of the MDHA uh, board. Oh, Mayor can sit in the middle. And we, I think we may need to share that mic. So. Oh, we did. Sorry. Okay. Thank you to our distinguished panelists. Uh, please proceed. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning. I'm Angie Hubbard, Housing Director with Metro Planning. I'm, um, in the essence of time, going to run through the case for housing. Um, before I start with my PowerPoint, I think we all know the uh, need for affordable housing in the city. Our Affordable Housing Task Force report says that we need 50,000 units um, over the next 10 years at the average of about 5,000 new units. Um, annually, so I'm going to, um, that's just a bigger countywide context. In that, let me present to you the um, current downtown housing landscape. There are over a little over 7,000 existing rental units um, in the downtown area. Only 2% of those are affordable. That is at 80% or below of the area median income. There are at least 5,000 units in the pipeline. That means that they are somewhere in the construction process to come online between now and 2024. Another 5,500 have been announced. And um, right now, none of those are income restricted. Another point to make is what the average um, income is, and we're using 2021 numbers, even though 2022 has been issued, but our um, data around the apartments is based on 2021 data. The area median, um, the 80% of the uh, income limit for our um, MSA, in which Davidson County is a part of, for a two-person household is $54,000. In the downtown area, 39% of our households have incomes below 50% of the AMI. Fair market rent, which is um, calculated by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for a one-bedroom for Davidson County in 2021 is $1,031. The average rent for a one-bedroom in downtown Nashville is $2,113. So making the case for housing, especially where we can get affordable housing, um, this presents an opportunity that I don't believe was discussed in the um, years ago when this first came up, but now presents itself with a great opportunity to add some housing stock um, to downtown. So what are these housing opportunities? One, we believe that we can at least get 350 new units. That's um, in the context of the overall site where we are keeping the school as well as some um, open space that Parks will discuss later. 
We can, as Metro control of the property, require affordability and set a dedicated mix of income. Of course, this is a prime location. Um, I think everyone knows that. It's on a multimodal corridor, both with a bus line, um, the greenway connecting to downtown, and then, of course, there's the proximity of jobs and services. So when we talk about what happens if we don't purchase the property, the alternative opportunity cost, um, we all know we cannot zone for affordability. So even if um, we also can't really zone for housing, this is the, in the DTC. So there are other commercial uses that a private developer could do, which means there could be no housing. There is limited control over the historic preservation opportunities that we could have that may make it harder to um, demolish the building, but doesn't necessarily prevent it from happening. One of the biggest opportunities we have is to collaborate with MDHA. They also, and they'll speak to it in, in just a moment, they have another parcel adjacent to this site. And this would be a great opportunity to continue that character and those opportunity, residential opportunities throughout the rest of the um, site at 88 Hermitage. And then there's the integration with Wharf Park and being very um, deliberate on how we activate the housing and that connectivity with the rest of the amenities that will be on site and especially giving those opportunities for um, persons in those dedicated income restricted units to be able to access a lot of amenities that may not be available in other areas. So following a um, purchase, what we would do is with at planning is collaborate with MDHA on a technical feasibility study and Dr. White and I have, have um, already talked about that and how we can build upon the planning work that was already done for um, the Rolling Mill Hill master plan. This would include community engagement so that we can determine the appropriate housing mixes as well as the, the potential for the adaptive reuse of the school as well as infrastructure, assess the infrastructure infrastructure needs for the uses that we would ultimately want to propose. We would include a development plan as a culmination of this work that would review the resources available to undertake the development plan, opportunities for public-private partnerships that are, one, beneficial to the city, two, that preserve the very long-term affordability of any housing that is constructed on the site, and then timelines for that development. And with that, I know I talked very quickly. I will be on site today to talk further and answer any questions that you have, but I wanted to dedicate the rest of my time to Mayor Purcell and Dr. Troy White with MDHA. Good morning, everyone. I'm Troy White, the executive director of MDHA. And in the interest of time, I will just talk a little bit about parcel A, which is uh, adjacent to the uh, site. So uh, we would work collaboratively with uh, Metro on the redevelopment of the site. We do have, we were involved with the redevelopment of Rolling Mill Hills uh, from the 2003 master plan. So we believe it is a prime location for housing with us being involved, we will ensure affordability. Uh, the site uh, across the street is a 80, 20, 80% workforce market rate, 20% is affordable. So we would ensure a level of affordability uh, in the site. Uh, that is our interest to make sure there is a housing lift uh, up at the site. Uh, we've been at the table since the conversations have started about uh, 88 Hermitage in the Wharf Park area. So we have been uh, involved. And with that, uh, I'll be here for questions, but not on the tour, but I wanna leave a little time for Mayor Purcell to talk a little bit about the history because this project started on his term as mayor. Mayor Purcell. Thank you, Dr. White. It is a, it's a special 
privilege and really an honor to have the opportunity to address uh, the Metro Council, this committee in particular, to be in this chamber. Uh, the same level of privilege and honor I feel for your confirmation of me as the chair of the MDHA board. Dr. White is exactly right. Uh, this is a project that I have been involved with from its inception. Uh, in the year 1999, just to put some perspective, you saw that number 5,000. In 1999, 900 people only lived in the core of Nashville. Nashville had been more successful than any city in America in moving people out of the city, believing wrongly that the problem with cities was people. And if we could remove the people, the city would thrive. We realized in this century, and this council's been a partner in this work ever since, that that was wrong, that we needed to encourage people to move back and in fact show the market what was possible in the core. And because of this council's approval of tax increment financing on a wide variety of locations within the downtown, that market understood what was possible. And also because of this council's support for affordability, each and every one of those investments was 20% affordable from the start 20 years ago. And that is why that 900 number has moved to 5,000, moved to 7,000 with 5,000 in the pipeline with who knows how many, and I hope many thousands to come because of your support and encouragement in this area. Rolling Mill Hill in that year was 30 acres. The only thing that was operating uh, successfully on those 30 acres was the morgue, uh, that was a, was a busy uh, morgue on that site, the only morgue that we had and had been there a long time. Uh, also on that site was the area where the police department washed its cars, repaired its radios, and where all old buses and fire trucks went to die. And they were there, visible to the world as you drove down Hermitage Avenue. We took this first great opportunity on Rolling Mill Hill, did the master plan, asked MDHA to be involved. The American Institute of Architects took it on as a project for me as a new young younger mayor and we went to work. The master plan was developed. And from there, all that you see occurred. And this council, MDHA, the city of Nashville has been a part of this every step of the way. Each phase was separate, but all of the phases revolved around this notion that people needed to be there to activate that space. And so the focus was on housing. The focus was on affordability within that housing. And from my perspective, this is the last great piece of this puzzle, this land. You've heard about the history of that site, but this completes that original, my belief, site development. Remember, when we started, there was a giant incinerator. The only thing that was off that site, just near it, was a large collection of, of garbage trucks, frankly, every morning that gathered there and throughout the day came into that basic area. Subsequent, because of the work of this council, the support of the city, but especially your focus on housing, that has been replaced by a vibrant community that now has this one last piece to round out the housing that, it, that can and I've always thought should be there. Uh, I appreciate all that you've done to support and push, frankly, the city to remain focused on affordable housing. The mayor is there with you in this quest, I believe, and MDHA, you can count on it, is there. We just had a great dedication of the new Randy Rogers development on Rosa Parks Boulevard just yesterday. Uh, this, There is more to come, but this, this particular effort will mean there is more to come than we thought possible. Thank you. Thank you so much to um, Mayor Bill Purcell, Purcell, Dr. Troy White, and Housing Director Angie Halbert for your presentation. I uh, want to keep things moving. Our next topic is the activation of Wharf Park and Greenways. And our presenters will be Mr. Tim Nach from Metro Parks Department, uh, Gina Ford, um, as well as Ms. Cindy Harrison from Metro Parks, uh, Greenways, and Open Space. And Gina Ford will be joining us virtually. So, I, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman, and we appreciate the opportunity to come and talk with you about 88 Hermitage. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to turn it over to Gina Ford, who is founder and principal with Agency Landscape and Planning out of Cambridge, Massachusetts. They are our uh, lead master planning uh, consultants on this, and she's joining us remotely. Uh, first, though, I want to give you a little bit of background and context on uh, Wharf Park. Um, 
Here's our site. Most of you, I think, are generally uh, familiar with it. And this is really just kind of an, an orientation, bird's eye view um, with some landmarks to, to understand our location. Uh, for the purposes of this discussion, we are including 88 Hermitage in the footprint of, of uh, the, the area that we are, uh, that is uh, within our master plan footprint. Um, we are nearing the end of, let's see here. There we go. Um, we are nearing the end of the master planning uh, process. So what we're uh, going to be showing to you today is a uh, re really a working uh, 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 document and normally we would spend 30 to 45 minutes on a presentation like this so it is very very uh, compressed um, our plan is to have a third and final round of public meetings on Wharf Park probably later this summer after, of course, the fate of 88 Hermitage is determined. Um, and uh, we are also uh, hoping to have uh, some uh, further development of IMHID's uh, encampment strategy on that site. And we, we oh, I'm not attempting to speak for, for IMHID on this, but they've been a great partner throughout this master planning process as as has uh, affordable housing. Um, once the master plan is complete, we do have the funding for phase one design. We don't have funding for construction, but we do for design. That process will take approximately 12 to 18 months. Uh, and then with construction funding, we would go through a bidding and permitting process. Uh, so it would be at the bare minimum eight, uh, 18 months before we would be prepared to mobilize on the site for construction. Now, another factor in that timeline, of course, is um, our ability to, Metro's ability to provide services to the people who are currently living there on that site. So we will continue to um, maintain close communication and coordination with um, MHID and other appropriate housing agencies. Um, from the very beginning uh, and baked into the RFP for this project, um, we, uh, Parks Department has envisioned this site as a park that serves Nashvillians first. We know that there are a lot of other existing parks in the downtown area that do a very good job of providing venues for uh, big events and other tourism related um, activities. Uh, one of the things that's missing in this area is a park that really has the basic building blocks of the type of quality neighborhood park that, that we want to be able to offer in every part of the county. So based on the countywide recommendations uh, in plan to play, um, uh, what we will be proposing on this site are a number of those uh, nuts and bolts uh, uh, amenities like basketball courts, pickleball, dog parks. Gina, Gina can get into some of the details on that later. Uh, and then there are a number of the types of facilities that again we know from plan to play that we want in Davidson County but are not the type of thing that we're going to build hundreds of or dozens of countywide. We might have one or two of, of these types of facilities countywide, and we've determined that Wharf Park will be a good fit for some of those types of facilities that will serve Nashvillians um, throughout the county. There are about 4,000 people who currently live within the walk shed of Wharf Park, including the residents of Napier Sudicum, and that is projected to double within the next uh, 10 years. Um, so that's a, a, a little bit of a setup for uh, Gina and um, now I will turn it over to the very talented and brilliant uh, Gina to uh, sh show you where the plan is. You're muted. <laughs> Thank you, I thought I was off. Hi, thank you, Tim, for that introduction and thank you all for having us today. We're really honored to be part of this incredible site and process. So I'm Gina Ford, as Tim said, Agency Landscape and Planning is a company I co-founded. I'm a landscape architect and principal and we work exclusively on public parks and waterfront parks in particular. We have a lovely, incredibly broad team that includes all of our engineering and specialty disciplines, as you can see, and really deeply rooted in uh, local culture um, by having folks like HDLA, Barge Cawthon, BDY, and other Hastings architecture, other great Nashville practices on our team. And so uh, just a high level overview of our team that's been working on this effort. 
part of the reason why I believe we were selected to help you all with this planning effort is that community engagement is core to how we work. And we were really thrilled to engage with your community a number of different times over the course of this process in September of last year and Ju January of this year um, at different forums for in-person events, a series of uh, online events, uh, many, many attendees, as you can see, over 600. In addition to the public meeting attendees, um, up to nine different stakeholder groups that we've visited with repeatedly through the process, making sure everything we're recommending is feasible and grounded in other planning um, and engineering contexts. Um, you can see across the top public forums, stakeholder meetings, online forums. We really tried to meet people where they were and give them a chance to come and visit uh, with some really creative engagement tactics. What we learned through that work has been pretty diverse, um, but pretty aligned. I think uh, starting from the left, areas of concern have really focused on exactly what Kent, Tim said in the beginning, that this is about providing a neighborhood scale park, a neighborhood set of amenities, that it's not about tourism, that people really wanna see it be a place they can take their families and spend the day. Um, a lot of concern about the folks living on site today and how that uh, transition happens in a humane um, and intelligent way, which we're happy to be collaborating with you all on. We asked the community to tell us about desired activities and uses, and as you can see, uh, atop of the list were really nature engagement and access to the water. A very unique characteristic of this incredible site is that it's low to the water, which means it floods, but it also means we have the opportunity to get people out on the Cumberland and really change the way they um, experience it, whether that's on paddleboard or rowing or kayaking. Um, and we see the community really is focused on nature engagement and nature space, which is a pretty unique uh, contributor, as you can imagine, to your downtown and uh, regional park system. Uh, we came back to the community with a series of design options and no surprise, they really liked the things that um, celebrated that connection to the river, including a new channel, as you can see here, a new kind of kayak launch that allows for that access, uh, loved ideas of nature engagement and trails and wildlife. And so we are trying to stay true to that. A lot of support also for the boathouse. We've had a lot of um, rowers come, but also um, other um, community members who have really stressed the need for safe water access which the boathouse uh, could allow to the broader public as well. So here's uh, the draft master plan. As Tim said, we're getting near the end of it, but really open to comments and observations. Uh, we really see it as a series of nature engaged spaces from the uphill quarry uh, next to 88 Hermitage, which is a unique bluff side site where we imagine um, incredible um, reuse of some of the remnants of that past to create nature play um, and walkable access to things like dog parks and picnic pavilions for the community. Community. Also celebrating that overlook uh, and the kind of steep topography there and how wonderful that view is from 88 Hermitage uh, to the water with a community yard on the city side and an overlook on the water side. We think that's gonna be pretty precious and wonderful. Uh, a floodplain park as you come down the entry road that really has a tremendous amount of different kinds of community assets from small um, tot skate parks to sand sports to a, a flexible one acre lawn. Um, and, and then that all is um, met with this uh, new launch along the river, a launch for the um, uh, larger boats called the rowers launch to the right, as you can see here, uh, and a smaller launch at the center of the project that really allows for paddle boards and safe access for kayaks and human powered craft. And then um, some limited amounts of parking and um, sports courts and skate parks under the bridge, a really dramatic place under the Sullivan Everett Evans Bridge that we're pretty excited about. As you can see, a limited amount of boat storage and a larger um, boathouse facility that will both offer um, uh, some public amenities such as restrooms and potentially a cafe that could enliven and make safe the park, uh, as well as the rowing facility um, uh, uses as well. I'm gonna walk through and just show you the different zones of the park and how we thought about that programming. And all of this is really driven again by that community feedback. So we'll start with the heart, um, which is we think a likely first phase, kind of one of the easier parts of the project to pull off. Um, and then the other um, phases, potentially the forest to the west, the underbridge as we call it, the kind of sports zone under the, under the Sullivan Evans Bridge and then the quarry landscape. 
Um, the forest is the westernmost edge of the park, and we really see this as that opportunity to offer the community the nature engagement it desires. So a series of outdoor fitness trails, uh, looped trails, uh, shaded places to be among nature, an overlook, overlook out over the river, which the community really loved, um, and some smaller kind of uh, family amenities like this tot skate lot uh, nestled within a broader picnic grove. Uh, we are really excited about the potential and we're calling these kind of uh, potential future opportunities for an iconic bridge to cross between Rolling Mill Hill and the park. Um, it's ghosted here, but it would cross over the railroad tracks and like this precedent in the upper left, provide a kind of tree walk down through the forest into the lower floodplain, uh, making that a more direct connection. The heart of the park is really where we see the combination of flexible spaces like the lawn and the boathouse terrace, and uh, first and foremost, really that, that access to the river. So here you see this kind of cut-in uh, kayak launch, which allows for human-powered craft. On either side of that, overlooks that have the potential for day-to-day uh, -day play, as well as sand sports. Um, we really think that there could be a tremendous uh, synergy with the boathouse here to both allow their program of larger rowing and row rower spectating, um, but also that that facility will allow for safe um, uh, kayak rental and, and water uh, safety lessons. And so a real opportunity to think about how to leverage that partnership for the good of the community. Under the bridge, uh, a an incredible kind of cathedral-like space under the Sullivan Evans Bridge. So we're excited to introduce a series of colorful court sports uh, and potentially uh, skate loops and skate parks that could really enliven and make this a place for the young adults, teens, and younger kids uh, to come and spend a day with the family. And all of this is immediately proximate and adjacent to um, drop-offs and parking uh, supply, which is uh, limited but provides that easy access. And then last but not least, this incredibly dramatic quarry site adjacent to 88 Hermitage gives us the opportunity for a really protected um, and dramatic space where we imagine nature play, a dog park, picnic groves, uh, a tot lot with adventure bridges. So really making this a kind of family destination within walkable access of the neighborhoods adjacent as well as adjacent to Rolling Mill Hill. Um, we also see the potential to really celebrate that view from the Selman Everidge Selman Ever Bridge and across the river to the site of this dramatic bluff by potentially thinking about a water feature that could transverse that slope and really become a kind of iconic water element. And so really imagining this as a place of uh, incredible nature engagement and delight. And lastly, just to turn it over to Cindy to talk a little bit about the Greenway, um, which is such a, a critical part of the connection this park makes. Thanks, Gina. Um, so you all know linear parks are what greenways are all about. Uh, they provide access to other parks, to commercial areas, to schools, to all the quality of life features that we enjoy in Nashville. And uh, I like to think of this one uh, kind of twofold. One, it stitches together all the beautiful elements of this park that Gina uh, just described. What you see in the dash line would be the proposed greenway and the um, solid green line is existing Rolly Mill Hill Greenway. So over the past decade or so, we have enjoyed a really great partnership with MDHA in the development of the Rolly Mill Hill Greenway um, and the connectivity that the acquisition of 88 Hermitage would provide is very significant in continuing on uh, to other parts of the city. This is part of the City Central Greenway, which is a 35 mile loop system that we're building um, around the urban core with connectors out into the community in all directions. If you, uh, from Rolling Mill Hill, the existing greenway, all the way to Ted Rose Golf Course is almost seven miles of Greenway. It connects into North Nashville. In the other direction, you are only about a mile from Browns Creek, which is also a Greenway ready to be developed as part of that city central Greenway system. So with this, with this acquisition, you're able to, we're able to build a greenway, get people away from the street, which is, is f a, a s focus for us, of course, low stress access, um, bringing with it public open space and conservation of public open space in, you know, an incredibly developing downtown space. Um, 
in addition to the linkages that I mentioned and the city central greenway system, it provides an, an amazing opportunity for view shed, conservation, access to the river, um, and a really alternative way to move about rather than being out on Hermitage Avenue. So um, anyway, those are, are probably the highlights of what this can uh, accomplish for us. Happy to ask, answer any questions uh, as, as we finish up. All right, uh, well, thank you so much. I'd like to thank our panelists on this section on the activation of Wharf Park and Greenways, uh, including Mr. Tim Nach and Ms. Cindy Harrison from Metro Parks, as well as Gina Ford from Agency Landscape and Planning. Thank you for your presentations. I will, we're running just a couple minutes behind, but not. Um, yes, quickly, but we are running a little bit behind, but just one moment, please. Um, Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I appreciate the presentation on Wharf Park. I think it's really exciting and I think it's gonna be beautiful and it serves a lot of purpose. This meeting is about 88 Hermitage Avenue. So it's a little bit frustrating that we're continuing to conflate the two. There's no parks property, parks related, playgrounds, anything like that, that is even in your plan. It's not determined or it has no effect. 88 Hermitage Avenue, the purchase or not of it or, or not. Um, has nothing to do with Wharf Park. Wharf Park is gonna be amazing regardless of that. I understand that it is adjacent to it, but it's also separated by a railroad that goes all the way across and some decently diff difficult topography. So again, we're conflating this. Um, we're over 10 minutes now over our allotted time because we've got a bus waiting for us. So I appreciate Wharf Park. Again, I think it's gonna be amazing, but I do wanna point out for whoever's watching that this has nothing to do with 88 Hermitage Avenue. 88 Hermitage Avenue has affordable housing thought process on there. Yes, a front yard, it looks like. Doesn't even have a use for the existing building right now, which I'm hoping it would be some type of community center or maybe uh, affordable housing something. Nothing to do with Wharf Park. So I didn't have a question, I had a statement, sorry. Okay. Um, thank you, Councilmember Johnston. Um, I, I'm sure this will be a topic for ongoing discussion, but I do want to move to our next presentation section, which is pertains to uh, public property. And our presenters are uh, Mr. Abraham Westcott, the public property director for Metro Finance, as well as Trail Webb, who's the former public property director for Metro Finance. Can you hear me? Oh, good morning. My name is Abraham Westcott. I am the new public property director for Metro Nashville Davidson County. You, you all might need to share the two. That one's turned on, but for some reason the volume's not going on. How about this? Can you hear me now? All right. Well, good morning again. Uh, my name is Abraham Westcott. I am the new public property director for Metro Nashville Davidson County. I started here in March of 22. Uh, over the last couple of months, I had enjoyed working with several departments for their real estate needs. Uh, since I've been in this capacity, I've seen many projects taking place in Nashville. I understand this is another great project for Nashville to undertake. Uh, if we move forward with this project, our staff will act professionally and expeditiously to complete this acquisition of this property. As I mentioned before, I am new to the, the property director position. I think it would be appropriate for me to have our previous public property director, Trail Webb, uh, to bring his comments about 88 Hermitage. Uh, I look forward to working with council moving forward with this and other projects in the future. Good morning, thank you, Dr. Um, Director Rescott. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today, uh, back in the chamber. Again, my name's Troab, the former public property director for Metro. Um, do you want to kind of go through the kind of qu a quick history about how we got to this point in terms of the public property process? Um, the state reached out to me when I was public property director. Um, I soon joined Metro, asking what would our plans be for 88 Hermitage. 
the state had already uh, done an appraisal back in 2017, I believe, um, that valued it at a set value. Um, they they said if we want to move forward again, we had to do two new appraisals. The state process requires two fair market value um, fair market value appraisals before they sell a property. Um, the state statute requires all state property to be um, to be have the local jurisdiction have an opportunity to to buy it at the fair market value before it goes to the private market. Um, so we, we asked the state to, yes, Metro wanted to have the opportunity to go through this process, see if this is something that we want to acquire prior to them going to the, the private market. If they, if the local government does not buy this property, the state will do a sealed bid RFP process and will award it to the highest bidder, qualified bidder. Um, there's no opportunity to sole source it to any type of private entity. Besides, um, the only sole source is to the local government. Um, the uh, as Director um, Hobart mentioned in her remarks earlier, that will Metro will totally lose control, or most control in terms of what will happen on the site if that if the state does go to a private developer to sell it. Um, since so the state did two appraisals, April of 2021 and July of 2021, they both came back at tw two different appraisals. The appraisers um, had not seen each other's work. One was at 20.3 million, the other at 20.31 million. So the state felt very confident that that was the fair market value at that time. Um, since that time, um, some other similar sized properties within a full block radius have, have sold. 8800 um, is, by metro parcel view, is 2.59 acres. We had a survey done, it actually came back 3.2 acres. So it's about a three acre, approximately a three acre site. Um, so 500 Second Avenue South sold in August, um, within a month of the last appraisal, for um, 34 million, which is 10.33 million an acre. The 507 Second Avenue South, which is 2.12 acres, sold for 35 million, which was 16.5 million an acre. And then 35 Hummitage Avenue, which is almost a, right down the street, um, was a 1.48 acre property that sold for 20 million, or 13.5 million an acre in December of 2021. Um, so the, as of now, 80 Hummitage is, is valued by the state at 20.3, which equals to at three, at three acres, um, just above 6 million an acre. So well below the recent transactions within a three or four block radius of the site. Um, from a public property standpoint, the, the thinking was to um, be able to leverage this. Um, so as another current market, fair market value that exceeds the acquisition cost. It affords Metro the opportunity to leverage portions of the site um, to create affordable housing market rate housing, um, and then also um, to enhance the, the visibility into Wolf Park. Um, if a development were to occur on 8A Hermitage, blocking the school or tearing down the school, it would also block the entry into the park. You, um, you won't, because of the steep incline of the cliff, you won't even know there's a park back there without, um, unless there's a, a huge sign and you would still would not know what's going on down the cliff without really having a, a, a more defined and more designed entrance through the park through 8A Hermitage. Into the into the site below, so um, again, I would highly advocate the Metro Council to move forward with this acquisition. Uh, I believe it is in the best interest of the city to to move forward, and I do believe NDHA and Metro Planning um, through the technical feasibility study will create the a, a really um, great process to to, to perform the public-private partnership that they are proposing. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, our presenters, Mr. Abraham Westcott and Mr. Trail Webb, for your um, the information that you've shared today. Uh, I will now recognize the administration table. Thank you so much, Councilman Withers, and thank you, Council Members. Uh, as you know, there is now a bus waiting for us on James Robertson Parkway. Uh, many of the presenters will be either with you on the bus or at the site to continue answering any questions you may have, um, and we are slightly running behind. So uh, we have Mr. Gabe Burgess from MTA here with us, uh, but if we can just take the elevator down to the James Robertson exit from the building and uh, board the bus, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, and this concludes this portion of today's meeting. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.